It's a challenging one, but it's one that will bring us closer to Christ. So if you join me with prayer, I'd like to just open with that. Father, thank you so much for all that you've done to, to call each one of us, separate us out for yourself. You said you knew us before the creation of the world, and Lord, this is not a, a last moment thought on your part. You have a purpose and a plan for our lives and our days. Each one of them, Lord, are unique and for great purpose, great value in your kingdom. Help us, Lord, not to lose any of these things. We pray that we would be fully devoted followers of Jesus. Lord, that you'd encourage us and remind us that we're never alone, that you've given us the Holy Spirit, Lord, to empower everything that you've called us to do. So our trust is in you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, also wanted to just remind you what a privilege it is to pray for each other. We have some special needs. I'd like to continue to pray for uh, Joan and for Ethel and for Kevin. And really, God's been blessing and watching over them. Just want to continue to be earnest as we address those particular needs. And I know there are many in the body. I like to go through the directory and, and just remember people before him together, and especially when we're apart so much. Uh, so I'd encourage you to do that as well. Also wanted to thank you for uh, your thoughtfulness about Sue and I's anniversary. I didn't know anybody got that old, but we're here, and we've had a great 50th, kind of celebrating for a month. Um, wanted to do it right this time because we don't expect to be here for the next 50, but looking forward to what time is left and want to use it all for his purpose. I've also really enjoyed uh, listening to Dave's Sermon and Pastor Dave has got a really a good handle and understanding of uh, how we need to approach the most critical questions personally. I think the most important in all of Scripture for us individually is out of Matthew 16, 13 to 16, where Jesus is walking with those who have been with him for a while and ought to have some background and understanding. And he asks this most critical question: Who do you say that I am? And our answer to that uh, determines everything else, whether he's just a, an encourager, a good teacher, a friend, somebody that can help us out when we're in trouble, or if he's God. And if he's God, then what does that mean to us? And how do we respond to that? Um, it's the basis of everything we do from that first step of conviction and commitment on. And um, one of the things that stands out to me so much too is, if you look at Matthew 16, 13 to 16, uh, Jesus is dialoguing with them and then with Peter in particular because Peter says, you're the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, you know, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father who's in heaven. This is a divine revelation in your heart and my heart, not just an intellectual assent or awareness. And then, curiously, five verses down from there, uh, he's walking with his disciples and he be, it says he begins to explain everything clearly in verse 21 and explain to them he must die and suffer and all of those things. Until we come to that point of commitment, Christ has made no commitment to tell us about the things that are secret and hidden and mysterious to the world, but are taught to us by the Holy Spirit. So in Mark 4, 33 to 34, he says, whenever he was with the crowds, he always taught in parables. But when he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything clearly. And a disciple is just one who has decided to live the life that his master lives and to follow him above all else. This morning, uh, we're going to talk about this topic of repentance. And I, I've noticed kind of a curious thing. And by the way, if you have paper and pencil, you might be surprised to hear that I have a lot of scripture for you this morning. And if you don't get it all down, I think it's going to be on the website or some other place where you can copy that. And, um, but you might want to draw, jot down some of the key scriptures that the Holy Spirit might point out to you. Uh, when I travel around to the different countries, I've noticed there's uh, really quite a difference in the way we describe people who come to Jesus. So we'll say uh, they've either come to Christ or they become believers um, or they're committed to him now. When I go other places around the world, the first thing they say is, we had seven people repent last week. Or so-and-so has never come to the place where he's repented. We have some dear friends in Ukraine whose son was just called into the army, and they're really anxious because he's never come to this point of repentance. He's been in church all of his life, 
but has never experienced this personal repentance. And I think we have a, a poor understanding of what it is. Um, a lot of times when we say we've come to Christ or we're believers now, we think that pretty well encompasses what's changed, but that's still far from what God has called us to be a part of. In fact, just those things alone, if they stand by themselves, I've come to Christ or I believe now, really puts us just only on par with the demons who are in hell. It tells us in James 2.19 that the demons believe that there's one God. And they said, if you do too, that's great. But you're no better than where they are. They've made no commitment to follow or live for him or be a part of his kingdom. So it has to be more uh, than just this shallow understanding of an intellectual scent about who God is. So true belief in Jesus Christ saving faith is never separated from repentance. Um, many of you have heard before the Greek word metanoia is used often and it means a complete turnabout, a change. And I think I have a slide for that. If I did the right thing. James 2.19 is the one about the demons. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 uh, just reminds us that when we come to Christ, everything in our life has changed. The old is gone and the new has come. So this metanoia, most uh, where we're born actually naturally, is to move away from any control, any authority, um, anything in our life that we think takes us out of the driver's seat. And people are running their whole life, especially away from God, who claims that now our lives belong to him and uh, our purpose is his as well. And the metanoia means now I've turned around and I'm running to God. I'm submitting myself to his throne and yielding to him. So I don't want to confuse terms or anything here. So just again, I want to remind you of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And that says that we've been saved by grace through faith. We know that, but believing faith, genuine faith, like I say, is always connected to our willingness to repent and be changed. Without that, there's no faith in Christ. Uh, we serve a holy God who has no connection and can have no relationship with sinful men who are unwilling to repent. If your sin, if doing things your way and living life for yourself is the preeminent issue in your life, then you cannot have an intimate relationship with a holy God. He's called us to let go of that sin and to grab a hold of life in Christ with both hands. So it does change everything. I've got some scriptures many of you are familiar with. Ezekiel 36 just simply says he's promised us not a fixed up old heart, but a new heart and putting his spirit in that heart and remove our heart of stone. A lot of times we're very hard um, about the gospel and about um, the things that Jesus taught about compassion for others and love and serving first and yielding and turning everything over to him. And he said, I, I know how to fix that. I can take that heart of stone that's been pretty beat up by the world and I can give you a heart of flesh. And it'll move you to follow my commands and laws, but from the heart, from a personal, passionate desire. Romans 12, 1 and 2, again, is familiar. And it says, in view of God's mercy then, we ought to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, which is our re reasonable act of service. Um, God says we need to present everything. The body, Christ tells us, is uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we start actually with the body that we're in and moving about and believing it doesn't belong to us anymore. We've been bought with a price. The dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on in verse 2 to say, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed with the renewing of your mind. Then you'll know God's will, his good, good, pleasing, and perfect will. A lot of times people ask me, well, how do I know God's will? Well, the first thing is, do you really want to know? Do you belong to him? And are you passionate enough about his desire to make it your desire? If you just want information, God will be very mysterious and strange to you. And, uh, seldom will he say more than you're ready to hear. In fact, maybe never. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, And he died for us so that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him. I realize that the agenda every single morning I get up, and I, I say this collectively for those who have put their trust in Christ, it's no longer about me. He died so that I could live for him. 
it's not a one-sided deal. He suffered, so I won't have to. But instead, I realize now I can participate in everything that it costs and means to be a part of the kingdom of God because my eyes are fixed on the author and perfecter of my faith. 2 Corinthians 5.17, because of this, now I know that all things are new. Everything has changed. The old is gone. Um, one of the problems with so many is that we've got one foot in each kingdom and we think, I still enjoy so much in the world, I don't want to give up what I think it had cost to follow Jesus. And for those who have really came, come to a place of new life in Christ, the world is, is a distant memory. Paul says, I've been crucified to the world and the world to me. It's not that we can't enjoy things here and we don't love what he's done and created. But the difference is, this is all about him now. Where if I'm out in nature, if I'm with my family, if I'm spending money, everything is centered around his will, his purpose, his life. John 3, uh, verses 3 to 7, say that unless you're born again, unless you start all over, like you came into this world with no possessions, and when you come into his kingdom, you come with nothing but your birthday suit. You have nothing. You can't offer him your house. You can't offer him your resource. You can't offer him any other uh, possession that the world would lay claim to because it's already his if you've really come to Christ. I really enjoy Billy Graham. He's a, uh, just a wonderful model and encouragement to me. His daughter reminded everybody at his funeral, he's not God, but she said, I uh, became a believer because of my dad. And I realized that uh, my dad loved God, loved Jesus Christ. And because of his faith and life, I have a model of what the Father's like that'll stay with me for the rest of my life. But when your family can say that, and not just the rest of the world, then God's done something profound in your life that bears fruit from the closest circle all the way out. One time he tells a story about being on an airplane because he traveled so much and he was sitting in his seat and he was kind of, his attention was drawn to a man who was just one seat forward and across the aisle. And this man was drinking too much and kept acquiring those little bottles of alcohol and he was being very uh, rude and uh, suggestive with the waitress or the stewardess that came to take care of him. And, and finally he turned around in the midst of all of the antics that were going on and he happened to notice Billy Graham sitting one seat back across the aisle and he goes, hey, you're Billy Graham. And Billy Graham said, yes, I am. <laughs> and he said, I'm one of your converts. And Billy Graham's response was immediate. And he said, you look like one of my converts. <laughs> His greatest fear in all of these crusades is that he would inoculate people to the gospel. That it just sound like all you need to believe is that there's a God. Or you need to ask for forgiveness for what you've already done. But he was afraid people's lives had never changed change, excuse me, that they would just go on about the business as they were before. One of the guys that I really appreciate too is a guy by the name of Charles Finney. And a lot of you may have heard his name. He was a lawyer and he came to uh, services on occasion because he was a very clever debater so that he could mock the preachers and people who were talking about God. He felt like they were ignorant, unschooled, and that this was fantasy. And then after one of the sermons, one day he went home and the Holy Spirit just overwhelmed him, put him right on the ground and opened up his heart. Paul prayed I, in Ephesians 1, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be open. And however the Holy Spirit does it, he did it to Charles Finney. And um, this is the best looking picture of Charles Finney <laughs> that I could find. This magazine is, uh, was created by one of my professors, a, a wonderful man. But he really highlighted the fact that Finney was probably the greatest revivalist in our nation uh, ever, and, uh, and one of the greatest in the world. Not just asking people to come to Christ, but having them come to a place of relationship with Christ. And by the way, just not to discount Billy Graham in any way, he started working with the Navigators in Dawson Trotman, and they both understood that unless people get got grounded and understood the cost of being a follower of Jesus, that they would never endure. So Charles Finney began to preach, and when he preached, he just knew nothing else except starting from ground zero, so he studied the scriptures over and over and over again. And when he preached, it was not because somebody else said something, it's because what the Holy Spirit 
had revealed in his heart was truth. And so he would preach what nobody else would preach. It drove people crazy. Um, and at first, he had a tough time of it. But they began to see the fruit from this. Uh, when we qualify the gospel and we say, well, we'll preach about this, but we really don't want to offend anyone by speaking about this too forthrightly. We might glance off of it, but he would just preach it. Uh, let me read you something about money because it's something Jesus talked about so much. And uh, he has a lot more to say about it because money is one of the major things that we need to learn how to handle differently. And we really need to re repent of all the uh, stuff from the world that's made its way into our heart and thinking. He said, um, what has been the state of your heart in regard to your worldly possessions? For those of you who really want to understand what repentance is, have you looked at them as really yours, as if you had the right to dispose of them as, at your, excuse me, as your own and according to your own will? If you have, write that down as something that you need to repent of. If you have loved property, sought after it for the sake of, uh, for its own sake, to gratify lust, ambition, and a worldly spirit, or to lay it up for your family, you've sinned and you must repent. What Finney understood from the very beginning is when I came to Christ, everything, my rec uh, reputation as a lawyer, my possessions, my home, my family, everything was suddenly in the Master's hands and they belong to him, and he can use them or dispose of them in any way that he saw fit. Many of you have heard me talk about Juan Carlos Ortiz, a friend who talks about the pearl of great price, and he just says, uh, this man finds this thing, and he wants to buy it. So he asks, how much is it? And the owner said, everybody has the, uh, the price of this pearl of great price. So he said, well, but really, how much is it? So you start with what's in his wallet, what's in his bank account, what he has to, where he has to live, what he has in his home, what he drives, um, what his family uses, his motor home, uh, all of his tools, everything that he has one by one. And the owner of the pearl says, okay, I'll take that one too. And I'll take that one too and that one too. Finally, he gets down to it and he said, I have nothing left. And the owner says, oh, I, f I forgot one last thing. You, yourself, you belong to me. Now I'm going to put all these things back uh, into your basket for you to steward. But you need to understand clearly, not one of them belongs to you anymore. Anytime that I need any of them, it ought not to cause any hesitation because they're already mine. And uh, I want to use them for the kingdom, and you get to be a part of that as my steward, my clerk. What a different understanding than most of the world has. Um, in Brazil and some of the places that I, I get to go to, again, like I say, they don't use the word somebody met Jesus or they just believe in God now. They use the word repentance, but they go further than that. In a lot of places, they say you're not a part of the family and you're not a brother or sister until you've walked in repentance for at least a year. So they're not concerned about big numbers, although because uh, and the Holy Spirit's been able to honor what they do, and it's so pure to the gospel. Everything has exploded for them. But the beginning was very slow. People thought this was a different gospel or unusual because it's not preached this way. But they found that people who walked in repentance became more and more like the first century church in the book of Acts. And also that it was everything... Uh, it was so important that it was the first thing that everyone in the Gospels and in the, the book of Acts preached right off the bat at the very beginning. So I've got some scripture down here, Matthew 4, 17. And it just says the very first thing Jesus preached after he was baptized was repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Matthew 3, 2, the, uh, John the Baptist said, Repent, for the kingdom is near. Luke 13, 3 and 5, a lot of you remember this because it talks about the Galileans that Pilate uh, killed along with their sacrifices and spilt their blood together. Jesus said, These people were no worse than any of you. But unless you repent, uh, you will perish. And that word in Greek to perish is apilon, apilami, and it simply means you will be completely destroyed, both physically and spiritually. 
And then he goes on in verse 5 and he talks about the Tower of Shalom and it falls and kills 18 people. He said again, they were no worse than any of you. But you need to understand that unless you repent, it's not an optional issue. You will, by, uh, you will perish. Acts 2.38, first thing the church preached. So Peter gets up, gives his uh, opening speech after the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for you and for your children. It starts with repentance. If we refuse to do that, there aren't any promises that God has committed to that would uh, lead us in the relationship that he's called us to in the first place. Acts 17.30, Paul says God's put up with ignorance. Many people over many nations and over many years, but now he's called everyone everywhere to do one thing. What would you guess that is? It's to repent. Uh, to change your course of action. It's not just moving away from bad things, but it's a whole life change from where you were going at one time to where you're at right now. Acts 3.19 says repent uh, so that your sins will be forgiven and so that times of refreshing can come from the Lord. It's all for good and it's meant to give us freedom and understanding and usefulness we've never had before. Psalm 36.2 says that the man who is unwilling to repent flatters himself too much to hate or detect his own sin. He's thinking, there's really nothing I need to repent of. I'm so much better than most people around me. I'm doing just fine, thank you. But we need to be honest enough to ask the Holy Spirit, what do you think about me? What do you think about the way I speak of people, the way I use your money, the way that my house is used, the way I treat my wife, my children, about the way that I spend my time, what I think about, if I'm useful to your purposes or if I'm all about me. Uh, repentance means that everything that we had and were before we came to Jesus is now completely irrelevant. It doesn't matter what your training is, your education. God's used some of the most illiterate people to do the most profound thing. He is not uh, handcuffed by that at all. In fact, sometimes it becomes a, a real burden because we think of ourselves as being different than other people. But all of that's past. The old is gone, the new has come. Luke 14, 33. Unless you give up everything that you have, you cannot be my disciple. Matthew 18, 3 says, Unless you change and become like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You come in as a child does without owning anything and without controlling anything. Now I know that I belong to him. I was bought with a price and I'm all his. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. There's not only a, a change in the peripheral things, but I know it starts from the inside. And even my thinking is unworthy of him and ungodly and needs to be completely eradicated, just wiped out, wiped clean, so that I have a clean slate and begin to think like Jesus thinks. God says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, like so many of you know, my thoughts are not your thoughts and your ways are not my ways. Is they couldn't be further apart, as for high as the heavens are above the earth. So are my thoughts and ways different than yours. And it tells us in 1 Corinthians 2.11, so how do I know his thoughts? And it says only by the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit knows the thoughts of God. And the Holy Spirit comes to those who have repented and obey him. Acts 5.32. Psalm 94.11 says, God knows all the plans of men, and he knows that they're all futile. We like to have uh, our idea of thinking, well, there's common sense and there's good reasoning, and I'm hanging on to that part, but I want to add any thoughts to Jesus. What he's saying is all of that needs to be completely removed. If you're earnest about following him with the freedom that Christ had when he was here on earth, then you need to understand that all of that, those presuppositions, preferences, education, and all of that, God can use in whatever way he chooses. But by themselves, they do not give you the wisdom or counsel of God. You will not understand him from your heart. 1 Corinthians 3, 19 and 20, the wisdom of man is foolishness in the eyes of God, and he knows that it's futile. How much money and time has been spent in the church and around the world, business, schools, everything else, with the most clever ideas that men have, but not the counsel and wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 16 says that 
the wisdom of God is not acceptable, is not accepted by the world, those who have not repented and have not come to faith in Christ. It's foolishness to them, and they don't understand it because it's spiritually discerned. But those of you who have repented, and those of you who are walking with freedom in Christ, it says, we'll have the mind of Christ, verse 16. I know I'm scooting along, but I hope you're staying with me here, because I think it's important. Um, Matthew 10, 37 says, not only our mind changes, but our relationships change. And we have a lot of counsel and wisdom about uh, from the scriptures about godly marriages, godly children, godly um, relationships in business and in the world and in the church. But 1037 is, if you value, uh, value any of those relationships above myself, you're not worthy of me. If your marriage is more important than God, and you have a false God, and your wife or husband was never meant to be your God, Galatians 1.10 tells us we ought never to have fear of men. And that's something most of us have to grow out of. But Paul says, if I were a pleaser of men, I would never be a servant of God. When I speak like Finney or anybody else, and I can just speak the gospel and in love, out of obedience to the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, then I can not only honor God, but you'll find many people who respond and the Holy Spirit can give power to the truth of his word. And then gospel, uh, Hebrews 10, 33, 34, and 35, I'll just do all of those together, say that sometimes because of your stand and your faith, you're going to look really stupid in front of the world, and people won't understand what you're doing. They'll insult you and persecute you, and you've stood with people like that, it says. And now, at times, it's even cost the confiscation of all your property, and yet you receive that with joy because you were able to share in the sufferings of Christ. Don't give up what you've already learned and earned. This process of repentance is something he's called us to that's part of the journey for the whole rest of our lives. Uh, let's see. Okay. So, uh, when God calls us into himself and to be a part of this journey uh, and calls us into a new life and calls us into our faithfulness with him and uh, decision-making around him and possessions that all belong to him. Uh, he calls us to be faithful, to uh, yield in every way. And I, I'd like to uh, just give you some references real quick for that too. I think I have them down here as well. So the God of this world is money. And um, in, in that, what we think is we have uh, a source of of security and it's an illusion of security by far. We think that we have a, a point of reference for all of our decision making. I have money or I don't have money for that. We think um, it indicates value. I, I had a curious thought last night when I was praying over this stuff and some of you know a guy named Simon Cowell who's on uh, American Idol and America's Got Talent and all of that stuff. I don't know if you know, but this last week he had a, an accident on an e-bike and he broke his back in several places and is critically injured, uh, went into surgery for six hours, has a steel rod in his back. Um, and I was just thinking uh, about his life and praying for him and for God's mercy and protection. And I think he's a funny guy, but he, he's been changing over the years. I'm hoping part of that's the result of my prayers, but he's been coming to a different place, I hope. And now that he's in, in this place, I went back and looked a little bit at his history. He, he's a dropout from high school, got involved in entertainment, and, and most of you probably know more about him than I do. I looked up what is called net worth, and uh, his net worth is $572 million right now, which is quite a bit money, quite a bit of money more than most of us have. But I was thinking of this Proverbs 11.14, and uh, it should actually say 11.4. Uh, Proverbs 11.4 says, Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, the day of trouble. What happens when your kids are really in trouble? What happens when you have an incurable disease? What happens when there's war? What happens when uh, we come to a crisis of, of weather, like many people in the Midwest who've <clears throat> lost family members? In the, the two hurricanes that are going on right now in the Gulf, there's never happened before in history. Uh, just all these crazy things. How is that money going to change things for you? And, you might find temporary sanctuary refuge someplace, but money is, you can't eat it, and it's not going to change your health, and it won't save your children. In fact, it might lead them to hell. 
Um, so money is not the source that the world says it is. Luke 16, 15. Uh, Pharisees loved money and they sneered at Jesus when he talked about these things. He said, but God knows your heart. And whatever uh, the things that are most valued in the world are detestable in the sight of God. First Timothy 6, 10. The love of money has led to the root of all kinds of evil and in fact led many believers astray and has cost them their faith. Mark 10, 17, uh, verse 17 to 28. It's a rich young ruler. I was with uh, lunch and with Dr. Serbeck and another friend who's a minister, and he was saying the only place in Scripture it ever tells us to let go of our money is with the rich young ruler. And that is so far from the truth. I almost stood on the table at lunch, but I was trying very hard to behave. It just tells us the rich young ruler, ruler came up and asked, how can I inherit eternal life? And Anyway, he did all these great things, and Jesus said, there's just one thing left. There's one thing between you and intimacy of the Lord, and that's because you've chosen something of greater value than him, and it's your money. Uh, all of your resources. Sell everything, give to the poor. You'll have eternal life. You can be with me now and forever. And You know, when you listen to the story, sometimes we forget why he came to him. He came because he's asking the question, how do I get eternal life? It's not a peripheral question of who can be a better believer or, or Christian but it's one that has a direct impact on whether or not we go to heaven. Have you let anything stand in the way? And repentance says everything has been laid at his feet. Luke 12, 32 to 34. When I do 32, people love that. They, it says, don't be afraid, little flock. It's the Father's uh, joy or privilege to give you the kingdom. You think, I love that. Thank you, Lord. That's a great gift. But Jesus goes on. He doesn't stop there. 33 and 34 says... Go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and then you'll have treasures in heaven that'll last forever. They'll never be taken away because your treasure's wherever your heart is. Acts 4, uh, 32 to 37 and uh, 2, 42 to 47. We talked earlier about Acts 2, 38 being the first sermon after the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the first words of that sermon when they asked what should we do, it was repent. And... Uh, just a few verses down from that. If you repent, then this is what you understand it to be. And it said the disciples were all together. They had everything in common. They were of one heart and mind. There was no need among them because there was so much excuse me, grace of the Lord on them uh, to love like Jesus loves. And it didn't just mean I have enough and I hope you get yours. Um, God says there's enough for everybody. Nobody had too much and nobody had too little. 2 Corinthians 8, 13 and 14. But like the manna, we are all able to take care of each other and there's plenty by God's grace. Uh, Matthew 13, 44 to 46. Uh, the treasure in the field and the, the uh, pearl. It doesn't say he offered 400 bucks for the pearl or he was going to try to get a bargain on the land so he could have the treasure. It said for both instances, they went and sold everything they had so they could purchase the thing of greatest value to them. Luke 19.10, and this might be getting a little bit long, but I'm getting down there, if you can hang with me. Are we okay, boss? Okay, <laughs> Judy said okay. Uh, Luke 19.10, a lot of you are familiar with Zacchaeus. You know, he's this short guy. Uh, I really like this guy. And uh, he was up in a tree because he couldn't see. Jesus said, come down. Uh, and people were saying, Jesus obviously missed it this time. He's a loser. He's a chief tax collector. He's not only the world's biggest cheater, stealing from his own people to give to the Romans, but he's over cheaters who do that. Everything in his life has been built around this deal of money. And immediately, Zacchaeus says, right now, on the spot, I give half of everything that I own to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody, which has been his whole life, I'll pay him back four times over. What do you think would be left after a lifelong cheater has done this? His home, his cars, his chariots, his furniture, his investments, everything he had would be gone. And you think, well, that's kind of stupid. Why didn't he just give some money to the church and keep enjoying all that good stuff? But he understood without any more dialogue going in, out. I either hold on to this or I try to hold on a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and neither one are satisfied. Or I grab a hold of what's right in front of me with both hands, and there's nothing that he wanted more. And you know, if it was stupid, Jesus would have told him, 
he would have said, what a dumb idea. And instead he said this, he said, today salvation has come to this house, not just to you, but your life has been so changed by a new, uh, a new understanding and a new God in your life that your marriage is going to change, your children are going to change, your associates are going to change. Everybody that's connected with your house, Zacchaeus, will be changed. I'd love to see him in heaven. I'm asking God for that opportunity. And when I go up, I imagine if I ask him, Zacchaeus, was that a dumb idea? Are you sad that your wife's here, your kids are here, that you did what Jesus wanted to do with your whole heart? And I don't think he'll have any misgivings at all. And yet so many are unwilling to do the same thing Jesus says over and over and over again. Mark 12, 41 to 44 is the, the widow who gives her last two mites. Jesus says everybody's given gifts, but it's all out of their abundance. This is not going to ca- cost lunch for anybody. Is that what it means to give to God? It's not equal giving, it's equal sacrifice. This woman is given all that she has to live on. This is dinner for her. This is taking care of her family. But Jesus told Peter, when he said, we've left everything to follow you, in uh, Mark 17, or Mark 10, verse 28, that no one has ever done that that won't receive a hundred times more in this life, in eternal life, in the life to come. We have a great option to do it his way. Sometimes I run into people and they'll say, well, great, you know, I think he asked too much. He doesn't ask too much. He asked for everything. And whenever we indicate something less than that in our preaching or teaching or whatever, then we've not carried the gospel uh, to the truth of Christ. Um, Sometimes people say, well, I don't think all the promises that he's promised me have come true. Not in my marriage, not with my kids, not with my finances. Even the miracles that I thought we would, would be a part of our lives in Christ are not what they're supposed to be. And um, if we feel like that's true, then Jesus has either failed. He tells us in John 14, 12, anyone who believes in me will do what I've been doing and even greater things than these. And my guess is the failure is not with God. The failure is with us. That we've come in with half a gospel and half commitment and think he's obligated to the promises and the um, purposes that he's called us out to. And he's not brought those to reality. He hasn't for one very clear reason. And I've shared with some of those of you who have been with me for a long time about a, something that happened to me the very first year I was in uh, full-time ministry. I was teaching high school up in Port Angeles, and uh, then I came down to Tacoma, and uh, I finished my pre-med. I did well on all of that. And I got a call one night from Fred Neth, a friend that a lot of you know. And he said, we want you to be your, our youth minister. And they had 10 or 12 kids. And I'm thinking, okay, being involved in medicine or being a youth minister and chase 10 or 12 kids around with pizza, uh, how does that work? And soon I talked and all of that stuff and prayed about it. And I was open because I felt like, God, I'll do anything you say if this is you, but how could this be you? You know, it's a big difference. And I got on the phone, and I was almost ready to tell him, you know, I don't think this is the deal for me. And he just said one thing. He said, if you want to follow Jesus, this is what you'll do. I have never had anyone be that bold or plain with me. But I knew that even if he didn't know it, what came out of his mouth was from God. And I would love, I love science, and I'd love to be a doctor. But I think what he had in mind for me was far different and God blessed it. We, we had over a hundred kids and we had kids that were coming at five in the morning to study the Gospels and to bring their friends at school uh, to Christ. And in one year, it changed seven different schools that we were part of. And one of the principals in the school closest to us became a follower of Jesus because of the kids in his school. I mean, it was a dramatic, wonderful thing. And we put on a big party uh, one Saturday night just for all the kids and we had a rock and roll band come, and the band was led by Mike Holmgren, who was the Seahawks coach for a number of years for us. He was a local high school teacher and assistant football coach and went to our church. So he said he'd be glad to bring his rock and roll band. And we had a great time, and everything went well, but my heart was just broken. When we were all done, I thought, Lord, 
Have we just inoculated a hundred kids to a cheap gospel? That wasn't what Jesus preached at all. And I, I had such a overwhelming sense that we had a little chapel in that church, at that church that was off to the side. And I went in and just fell on my knees in the hallway, or aisleway of that. There were seats on both sides, and then there was a, a platform up a few steps with an altar. It was a white oak altar with a cross and a, a chalice. And the, it was a strange altar. It was beautiful, but it had a large top on it, and then the front of it curved in. And then it was straight in the back, so the top was bigger than the bottom, but it was so heavy, it was pretty solid. Uh, and I was praying, I said, God, I'll do anything for you. You've got everything that I own. You've got my heart, my life. And if I'm just not crazy enough, if you want me to take my van and stand on top of it at the drive-in burger place with all the kids there and yell, repent, I'll do it. I'm in. You know, and I, I was convincing him of how good I was going to be on this. And he just said, I want you to get on the altar and offer your whole life. And I said, I am. God, I have promised everything I've got there. And I'm on the altar. And I promise, I know the problem with a living sacrifice is that it wants to crawl off the altar. But I'm here, you know. And, um, and anyway, he told me that a couple more times. And I finally just said, you mean, you actually want me to go up there and get on the altar? And You know, when God tells you something, you're unwilling to obey. He just stops talking. And uh, when it was quiet, I knew that he was serious. So I got up and I stood by the altar and I was thinking, okay, he wants me to image this in my mind because somebody may come in that door, they're still cleaning up after a party and I'm gonna look like a dumber than a barrel of hair. You know, this is gonna be so embarrassing. And so I kept telling him how committed I am, but it didn't work. Finally, he just left it. Are you gonna do this or not? And I took a deep breath and I threw my left leg up on the front of that altar and everything started to fall down. The altar was off balance. It tipped over the chalice and the cross went flying. I grabbed him in midair, used my gluteus maximus to hold up that altar and uh, was breathing heavy and it made a ton of noise. And uh, put it upright, set the cross and the chalice on the floor. And I, I just was breathing hard and the Lord said, that's the problem. You promise to do everything but what I've asked. And when you do offer yourself, you throw a leg up there and you think that's close enough. What I want is your whole self. I want your heart. And I want the rest of your days. So I actually climbed up on the altar. And I laid there. My legs were flopping over one side and my head over the other. And I said, God, I'm going to stay here all night if this brings you pleasure. And God said, you're really slow. And I have to teach you very intentionally. But I hope you never forget what I've asked you to do today. It's not your leg that I want. It's your whole self. I want you to be all in with everything that you've got. And I'll accept no repentance less than that. Friends, our Lord is coming back. And he's not coming back for a wrinkled church. He's coming back for his bride, the church, without spot or wrinkle. That's corporately, but it's also personally, to remove everything that's hindered us from intimacy with him. And I believe you need to do this daily. It's not a one-time deal in an altar in San Jose, California. It's every day or every other day. You come before him and say, God, what's in my life today that I put in front of you? What's dear to me that I haven't laid at your feet? And like David in Psalm 139, 23, and 24, he just said, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test my anxious thoughts and see if there's any unclean way in me, anything between you and me, and lead me in the way that leads to everlasting life. Hebrews 4, 7 says, Today, if you've heard his voice, don't harden your heart. Amen. Lord, I ask that you would remove any hay and stubble, anything that is not from the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would refine the silver and gold. Lord, that you would help us to understand personally, what does this mean for me? I know that you want us to be responsible for the things that we have. So that's not indiscriminate or casual or in any way. But Lord, we understand right now, for those who have put their trust in Jesus, 
that everything is yours and we'd be thrilled for you to use whatever you want because we know it'll serve the purpose of building the kingdom and last forever. We need you, Lord. I ask that you continue to teach us daily. For Jesus' sake, amen.